of those amen nights. Amen. We came in, it was just Savani and myself, and uh, she said, well, God's going to do something tonight. Amen. Amen. I'm torn between two directions. And I'm still trying to make up my mind. Lord God. Father, by your spirit, Lord. Kayla, a while back, I emailed some things to the website. Did you happen to see those? Restoration of the church and destination of the church. If you would, please. So we've been looking at the book of Revelation. And in some cases, you have to wonder what it is you're looking at. And we know, we really know what it is. But where's the place for it? The Lord said, no man knows the day or the hour. But yet, there is a progression in God's timetable and his direction for the church. After the Dark Ages, the Christian Catholic Church was the keeper of the word. And that was in Latin. And for the longest time, I mean, I'm old enough to remember Catholic Church being in Latin. Not a clue. The bells would ring, you would stand. The bells would ring, you would kneel. The bells would ring, you would sit back. And after a mixed up handful of these things, you got maybe about three sentences out of a gospel, and that was it. In the Dark Ages, people had no education. So they were told what to do by the church. It was unlawful to even try to read a Bible because you'd never understand it. But after many years of ignorance, the light began to dawn, starting with a German Catholic priest named Martin Luther. And because of his frustration in the church and things going on, one of his leaders, probably just to shut him up, told him, why don't you translate the word of God into our native tongue? And so with that translation and that labor and that work, Martin Luther came up with his 96 points of disagreement with the doctrines of the Catholic Church. And so he protested. And that was the beginning of the Protestant movement. That was around the year 1500. In that time period in Germany, in England, and Switzerland, 
There were the births of the Lutheran, the Episcopalian, and the Presbyterian churches. And what they taught, what their revelation was, their spiritual experience, was listed under something called justification. The word justification means the act of showing something right or reasonable. And the justification was that you no longer had to have somebody tell you what the Bible meant. You had now, with the Gutenberg Press, you had a written word in your own language. And so the study of the word for those that were literate became an open door. Can you imagine after hundreds of years of ignorance, you at last were able to take a copy of the word and read it for yourself. That led to the study of the word. Those that could read, those that could read, read it to people that couldn't read. And from the study of the word came prayer and understanding. And from that, a spirit of peace. There was no longer torment by the Catholic Church. There was no longer repentances and, and uh, God, I can't even remember what, what the things were that, that doing penance and and, uh, you know, uh, suffering because that's what you were supposed to do. In the year 1500 and for 300 years after that, the ability for people to find the Word of God and begin to study it was available to them. My question to you study the word and pray, the sanctification, which means to be set aside. Set aside for what? One of the manifestations was conviction. People that were reading the word found themselves being convicted in their lifestyle 
and their thought patterns. So conviction changed many people. And it brought them to an increase in faith. An increase of faith caused people joy, and joy brings sin. And so there was a release. There was no singing in the churches except what the priests were doing. Uh, and, and now with this being available to you and these other denominations manifesting, preaching the word, conviction was big. And faith became strong and manifest in many dimensions. There were hymns that were created and sung, and the hymnals in the churches. So there was joy in the house of God, yeah. mm -hmm. and joy brought singing. Mm -hmm. Singing not only in the church, but singing in your life. Yes. Yes. A release has come yes. to the dimension that you were free to express yes. your appreciation and your love, yes. and, and just everything that your newfound faith has brought you to. Amen. A hundred years later, in 1900, there was a movement called the Pentecostal Movement, which were birthed in the Assemblies of God, Pentecostal holiness. Amy Semple McPherson in the Four Square Church. Pentecostal Church of God and the UPCs, United Pentecostals. The manifestations that came forth were speaking in other tongues. That's 1900. Speaking in other tongues. Hand clapping. And another expression, applauding the Lord, shouting. No longer were you in the same true edifice where, where a whisper would carry throughout the building. Now you were shouting. People began fasting. There was expressions of dancing in the spirit. And musical instruments were allowed into the house of God. That's a whole other big expression. So, where are you at? Where am I at? Do you study the word? It's been made available. Do you pray? It's been made available. Is there peace in your heart? Have you fallen under conviction? Have you had to face something that needed to change in the way you live? Has your faith grown? Is there a hymn in your heart? joy and sing. And in 1900, 225 years ago, how many people are speaking in tongues? I do to a limited basis. Mostly in my own prayer. The Spirit gives utterance when words cannot Words don't work. Sometimes there are no words. Tongues. You need to cultivate that. Hand clapping to be expressive. God has called this church to be expressive. It's no longer a solemn assembly. We are in the presence of the King. Amen. And there's rejoicing. Yes, yes. Amen. There's shouting, fasting, dancing, and 
and musical instruments. Fifty years later, 1950, came the charismatic movement. Out of that were birthed groups called the Latter Rain, discipleships, kingdom churches, and fellowships. The manifestation or the spiritual experience was singing praises. We had a little bit of that tonight. Singing praises, not words on a book, words in a page, but something that wells up from inside your heart. An expression, a release. Spiritual song came forth. Word says, sing to yourselves hymns and spiritual songs. New dimensions of worship. Worship. Have you learned to really worship the king? And in the realm of worship, expression came body ministry the understanding that there is impartation something that you can receive or something that you can give and body ministry means the body ministering to each other My pastor used to say one of the greatest needs is having discernment and being able to discern the spiritual condition of the person next to you. Sometimes we'd like to just ignore that. But the person sitting next to you, I will guarantee, has a need and could stand some prayer. Body ministry. Another expression, big today, is praise in the dance. This house needs to pray for our dance team that the Spirit of God falls on them so mightily that it renovates their very thought of what they're doing. And acts of faith that brings us to where we are. And you put up, that was restoration of the church. Now destiny of the church. The church is going somewhere. And we're dealing with revelation because that somewhere is leading to that. We look at, at the thought of the rapture and took that word apart to see that it was being caught up in an atmosphere, in the breathable air, here walking on the ground, but being caught up into his presence, being oblivious to anything else going on. The church, though we may not see it or feel it, is moving on. There's another experience that's due to happen. It's called glorification. Now, glorification is a much higher realm than anything that we have experienced. High praises.
We've read scriptures that talk about the sound of many waters. The sound of thunders. God is looking for a people that would release themselves unto him into a direction of uncluttered high praise. A new realm of righteousness needs to come upon the church. We need to experience true agape love. No holes barred agape love, no matter what God's love. And divine unity. We need divine unity in the house. And the house needs divine unity with all the other houses of worship. Because there are not 500 bodies of Christ. There's one. And it's got to agree with itself. And it's got to come to the point that whatever the subject matter the pastor's speaking on next week, all the other churches happen to be right in that vein. There has to be a unity. The manifestations that would come from that are the resurrection from the dead. That's the fifth act mentioned in Hebrews 6, 12. In the realm of gifts, there'll be working of miracles. You know, Brother Rodney used to say the first miracle is the hardest. But what would we, what would happen if we began to experience miracles in this house? We do. We do. But I'm talking serious people breaking the door down to get in kind of miracles. Discerning of spirits. Much of the struggle in our lives is the inability of yet to truly represent the church is but the first fruit. A perfect church united. Showing the kingdom to the kingdom of this world. Another phase is eternal judgment of all the gifts and the fruits, but here is Joel's army of the Lord. You can't have an army without people that are united, committed, with the same view and the same purpose. The army of the Lord is a group of overcomers, and they are the bride of Christ. A deeper revelation farther on will be the ultimate perfection of God's church, the thousand-year reign of peace on the earth. There is, I just went through that quickly. We are moving on, though we don't see it. We don't fully understand it. We don't 
comprehend and really we're not we're not ready although we're ready but somebody's going to hear a word from God and it's marching orders to move on God has taken his church and put her away in a safe keeping The woman brought forth the man-child and then was taken away to be somewhere safe, to be fed and cared for. Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder, is that voice of many waters, the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. The Lord says, Behold, I do a new thing. And so it is with the song that's going to arise out of someone's deepest inner being. A new song. And the harpers will harp. And the singers will sing. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and before the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouths was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. What a victorious passage of scripture. The church, which is the 144,000, is cleansed and purified and redeemed by the blood of Christ. And sits now before the heavenly throne of God and sings the song that only the redeemed can sing. That voice belongs now to the 144,000 who sing praises to their God. When this earth becomes the kingdom of God, heaven will become a literal place. Let thy will be done. Let it come as it is in heaven. Verse 4 says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. The 144,000 men and women were set aside, set aside, dedicated to purity and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. These people represent the first fruits of the kingdom before God's throne until the church literally becomes part of them. First fruits. Now, however, we who are first have already seen the one who is to come. As I was looking at that passage, men and women set aside, dedicated to purity and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, I thought, of the Nazarite vow. Old Testament. 
Nazarite, a person who took a vow to separate from certain worldly things and to consecrate himself to God. Among the Hebrew people, anyone could take this vow. There were no tribal restrictions as in the case of the priests. Rich or poor, man or woman, master or slave, all were free to become Nazarites. Nazarites did not withdraw from society and live as hermits. However, they did agree to follow certain regulations for a specific, specified period of time. While no number of days for the vow is given in the Old Testament, Jewish tradition prescribed 30 days or a double period of 60 or even triple times of 90 to 100 days. Samson, Samuel, and John the Baptist were the only Nazarites for life recorded in the Bible. Before they were born, their vows were taken for them by their parents. Once a person decided to make himself holy unto the Lord for some special service, he then agreed to abstain from wine and other intoxicating drinks. This prohibition was so strict that it included grapes, grape juice, and raisins. Perhaps this was, listen, perhaps this was to guard the Nazarite from being controlled by any spirit other than God's. You are called and you are set aside and you are groomed and we are caught up in his presence so that he may hide us away or put us in a safe place just as the exodus, the blood was put on a doorpost and they, they ate the lamb and went inside while the death angel came by. That's the tribulation that's going to go on in the world. How are we going to experience it? You betcha. But are you going to come through? Amen. Amen. Verse 6 and 7. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwelt on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. We are in this period. We cry, come and join us as we worship the God of our creation. Not many people want to hear it. How many of you invited? And they said, not for me. Come, join the mighty army of God. I think of that old military poster, Uncle Sam wants you. Jesus Christ. Once, you. Verses 8 through 11. And there followed another saying, Babylon is fallen and is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of the strong woman. And the third image 
Babylon shakes and the nations of the earth are perplexed. They don't know whose side they're on. They build up armies to fight and they don't even know their enemy. The world systems, Babylon stumbles and the church of the living God will help spoil the nations of the earth. The church will be that mountain that Daniel saw coming down that will finally consume all other kingdoms. We sound the trumpet of the third angel which warns don't marry yourself to worldly affairs. The church needs keen discernment to differentiate between those things of God and his church and those things of the world. That is the warning of the third angel. Verse 11, the smoke of their torment reminds us that satanic forces will not survive. People must achieve unity with each other. Jesus said that our prayers would be answered when we agreed with someone else in prayer. God looks for a group of people to demonstrate his kingdom to the kingdoms of this world. God looks for a group of people to demonstrate his kingdom to the kingdoms of the world. Until there is a body which has attained unity to that level, Christ's coming cannot take place. Verses 12 and 13. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I hear a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. This passage refers to those who follow Jesus in covenant. They keep agreement with the family of God in tithing, church attendance, and submission to authority. I think I will wrap it for tonight at that place. Amen.